Hey guys, my name is Rich Severin. I'm a cardiopulmonary uh, clinical specialist here based in Chicago. Um, based on the kind of the popular request by quite a few people, students, current clinicians, uh, they'd asked about providing a resource describing how to act I actually take an accurate blood pressure measurement. So we'll go over the technique here. Uh, I have Granita on the camera. I have Yomi here who's gonna be serving as our mock patient. Uh, so the first thing we always wanna make sure our patients are doing, we can come a little bit closer for this one. Uh, we wanna make sure that our patients are sitting uh, comfortably for about five minutes. Yomi's been sitting here for a few minutes now. Uh, we wanna make sure that their feet are flat, their back is supported, um, that they've gone to the bathroom, so they're not holding on to a bladder. Um, and that when we're taking it, that their arm is at, at uh, heart level, um, it's supported, and that they're not talking. So Yomi, can you make sure you don't talk while we go through this? A couple things, uh, we always wanna make sure that we have our trusty stethoscope here. Uh, it's a pretty nice one here, it's a Litman device. Um, you don't really need a super duper one, even a basic uh, stethoscope works. I prefer to manually assess it because um, you, while you can use an automatic or an osmometric cuff, uh, you can't use an osmometric automatic cuff for exercising blood pressure, which might, we might do another video on later on. There are some more advanced uh, devices by Suncoast Medical, the, which are automatic oscillatory cuffs. You could use those, but they're like seven to ten thousand dollars per per device. So, standard manual measurement works really well. Another thing we have is your blood pressure cuff or swing of a manometer. Um, there are some guidelines published out there. Ethel Freeze put out a great paper in 2011 describing what, what you need to do. Basically, the way it breaks down, you want to have the width of the cuff be about 80% of the uh, arm width. Most individuals, a regular adult cuff will work, and that's going to work just fine on Yomi here. Um, so I can come around this side here. Okay. So uh, to make things easier, because we could have Yomi rest his arm on the table here, um, I you know teach it. A method that you can use anywhere. So, uh, Yomi, can you place your arm on my shoulder here? All right. So this way, it keeps his arm supported. I have both hands here. Uh, it's nice and easy. We'll roll up his uh, shirt sleeve there. Okay. Um, you could use the table, but again, you might not have a table. Uh, so this, works, this technique works pretty well. Place our cuff. Now it's critical that when we place the blood pressure cuff, we don't want to place it too close to the antecubital fossa or lecranon fossa or however you want to call it. Um, it should almost fit right in the kind of the medial part of the, of the biceps, so you have enough space to access where the brachial artery will emerge, which is right here. It's also critical that his elbow stays as straight as possible. Um, what we're basically doing with the blood pressure cuff is that we're amplifying the, the sound of the occluded artery returning flow. Um, if his elbow is Bend, it's not going to bring that artery as close to the surface. So we want to keep it as straight as possible so when we place our scope, we can hear the sound as, as you know, clearly as possible. Um, we'll wrap it around. There's a little guideline here um, on most cuffs. You can see this little range device. <clears throat> this will show us if this uh, cuff circumference is adequate. Um, if it goes beyond the range, the cuff, their arm's a little bit too big. If it's below it, their arm's a little too small. The only of course, is perfect. All right? Now, you have this little dial here. Um, you can place this either on the little clip here. You can come around, we can show it here. Um, there's a little clip here that demonstrates the details of where this device kind of sits. Um, and you know, that's, that's where we can place it. Or some students actually taught me uh, that you can even clip it to your wristwatch. It's a little nifty little technique there too, especially when you're doing exercising blood pressures. But for the purpose of, of this, uh, we'll clip it on here on the Yomi. And we'll get going. So we'll come back around on this side. Now, when we're inflating, um, first thing we always want to do is check, make sure our stethoscope is on. So we'll give it a nice, light, light tap. And if we hear the sound amplify, we know yeah, we're, we're, it's, it's on. If it's off, what you'll hear is a tap, but it won't be amplified. Okay, this is basically just an, an amplifier, almost like a very, very, very uh, low-tech microphone. Okay? When we're placing our scope, um, I always use a peace sign. This prevents us placing our thumb, and it just gets you in good habits. When you do it during exercise, you really want to lock on to that position there because you want to keep his arm stable. Okay, so I use that approach, and it's also you know, your thumb, you know, may potentially produce its own pulse, which could also affect your reading. So I always use the the piece grip and lobster grip, just like that. Okay, just a good practice. Also, always make sure your stethoscope is pointing, your earbuds are pacing, pointing forward. 
your acoustic meatus in your head is kind of aligned this way. Um, so if you're placing it the wrong way, you're not gonna be able to propagate those sound waves effectively. So you really wanna make sure it's aligned, okay? So pointed towards your nose, easiest way to remember, okay? Now when we inflate, um, we could go over, we'll talk about the ways to prevent oscillatory gap, but um, for this, we, you know, we would probably only need to do it. But So we're gonna inflate, most people, you can probably just inflate to 180 or 200. Okay, and you're gonna come around this side here. Okay. And then we'll slowly deflate. The deflation speed is key. We want this to be about two millimeters of mercury um, per second. So nice and slow. If we go too quickly, we're not gonna get an accurate measurement. And we're listening for that first sound that's gonna indicate uh, the systolic blood pressure. You might see the needle moving, but don't go by the needle movement, go by what you hear. Okay, I got 108 over 74. So that's perfectly normal. Our normal, uh, normal ranges for blood pressure are still less than 120 and less than 80. So it's between 100 and 120, and between 60 and 80, the new guidelines state anyone above 129 now is diagnosed with hypertension. It's a new guidelines. Um, but realistically, the evidence suggests that even if your values are above 125, which is still really not that high, that's still, um, you know, is predictive of future kind of untoward events. So it's really important that we're taking blood pressure measurement very serious because you know, your blood flow kind of uh, predicts the health and, and function of all your organs. And if it's running at a higher pressure than it should be, it could lead to complications. So uh, that's blood pressure measurement in a nutshell. Again, PTs, you know, it's something we really need to be aware of. 50% of patients um, who even get diagnosed and are receiving treatment um, aren't controlled effectively. It's not even a guarantee that patients are aware of their hypertension, especially younger patients. And as PTs, you might be the entry point to the healthcare system. Um, and our research here um, in, in our lab, and our lab group demonstrates that the, the risk population of PTs is pretty high. And we treat older populations where we start seeing hypertension and complications of blood pressure more often. So hopefully this, to, this tool was uh, useful to you guys. We'll be putting out some more stuff for you guys uh, to utilize as well. Thank you very much.